Hey guys, hopping on to do part two, mostly for people on the replay here so that they can break this apart a little bit so that it's not quite as long. Um, so for those of you guys who were just on the live with me before, um, this is gonna be part two talking about voices of accusation, how God is really dealing with that right now in this season. Um, and so again, this is part two. And um, basically we're in the book of Daniel um, for all of this. And this is going to be starting in chapter four. Okay. And so what's going on with this, <coughs> excuse me, is King Nebuchadnezzar, um, basically is in a place of disobedience to the Lord. Okay. So this is where we're going to start talking about how God is going to be dealing with ungodly leadership, um, and how he is really dealing with the place of pride. All right. And so basically what's going on is King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he doesn't know what it means. And so he remembers that Daniel was able to help the first time. And so Daniel is called in to help to interpret this dream for the king. And basically God starts calling out King Nebuchadnezzar on behavior. Amen. You know, at this point, King Nebuchadnezzar has been shown great signs and wonders. Amen. You know, he is causing harm to the people who are underneath his rule. He is causing harm to the people who are underneath his care. And he's still in a very prideful place. And so God is about to deal with this, you know, leadership that is not doing what he's supposed to. Amen. And so God gives him this dream. How many of you guys know that God can deal with people very, very quickly? Amen. On these different situations, even the people who you think are untouchable. You know, this is why it's so important that we pray for those who are in a position of authority, that we pray for family, that we pray for friends, that we pray for our enemies. Amen. This stuff is extremely, extremely critical. And so God is about to deal with this unfair leader that is in a place of extreme pride. <laughs> and so in verse 24, Daniel basically interprets the king's dream. And that's where I want to pick up. It says, this is the interpretation, O king. It is the decree of the most high God, which has come upon the Lord, my king. You shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass as do the oxen. And you shall be wet with the dew of the heavens and seven times or years shall pass over you until you learn and know and recognize the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and gives it to whomever he will. Notice who's ultimately in control. Amen. That phrase says that God's the one who gives the kingdom to whoever he will. Amen. And so I think it's interesting. Um, we're about to read down a little bit later um, that God gave King Nebuchadnezzar this period of warning. Amen. He gave him this time period where he was able to repent if he wanted to, but we will find that the king chose not to use that. This is what has been going on in this past season with a lot of different unfair and unjust situations that have been going down, not only in a place of leadership, but also, <coughs> excuse me, in a lot of people's personal lives. Amen. You know, they have been facing some very unjust situations that have been going down and God has been giving this time, this season to repent to these leaders. But now this justice is coming forth. Amen. Now these leaders that have chosen to still operate in a place of pride are very much being dealt with. And God is saying, no, you're going to find out that I'm king one way or another. God's going, you're going to find out who the one true God is one way or another. Amen. And so Here's the deal. Let me keep reading. In verse 26, it says, And that it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots to the tree. Your kingdom shall be sure to you after you have learned and know that the God of heaven rules. In other words, God was saying, you know what? Until you are willing to acknowledge me, until you are willing to follow me, until you're not willing to, you know, until you're willing to stop relying on your own strength, amen, and until you are willing to put me first and to be dependent upon me, you're going to get removed from this position of king. And guess what, ladies and gents? God doesn't have to use any people to do it. He can do it himself, Amen. You know, a lot of you guys are looking at situations in your personal life and you're going, this situation is never going to come through. You know, this unfairness has been going on for years in my life. 
You know, these situations of injustice have been happening for forever. Uh-uh, God is God. He doesn't have to use other people to take these people out, you know, that have been puffed up in a place of pride. He can deal with it very quickly. And this is a cautionary word for Christian leaders as well, or anyone who's in a place of leadership. Maybe it's in the workplace. Maybe it's in your home, whatever it is. You know what? God will put up with stuff for a season to give you a chance to repent, but then eventually he's going to deal with this stuff, ladies and gents, right? And so basically, you know, this cautionary word from Daniel is spoken to the king and he goes, when you learn and know that the God of heaven rules, that's when you'll be allowed to step into your place of promotion. But because you are not willing to do this, the risk is you're about to be demoted king and God, you know, is going to be the one to facilitate that. Amen. Verse 27 says, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins and show the reality of your repentance by righteousness by right standing with God in moral and spiritual rectitude and a righteousness in every area and relation and liberate yourself from your iniquities by showing mercy and loving kindness to the poor and oppressed, that if the king will repent, <coughs> there may be possibly a continuance and lengthening of your peace and a tranquility and a healing of your error. Listen to me. It's one thing to say you're going to do better, you know, and a lot of believers have said that in this past season, that everything from outward reflection, when you're looking at these people's lives, you would think that there's nothing that's going on behind closed doors that's wrong. You would think that their lives look perfect, but God sees the inner motives of the heart. He sees what's really going on on the inside. He sees the spouses that are treating each other badly. He sees the leaders that are abusing people in the workplace. He sees the people that are walking in pride, that are engaged in secret sin in their personal lives. Amen. God sees this stuff. Other people might see it, but God sees this stuff. Amen. And he's going, you've got to truly repent. And it can't just be a lip service to me in these different areas. You've got to decide this day, who is the God that you're going to serve? And if you're not willing to decide that, then you're going to get demoted. Amen. This is what God is doing right now. And so the other thing is, I don't know if you guys caught this, but he was directly calling King Nebuchadnezzar on the way that he was treating the people underneath him. This is powerful, ladies and gents. You know, God is not gonna tolerate leaders that are just treating people like trash in this season. He is dealing with this right now. You know, he is dealing with people, let's say they're not even in leadership, but people who are just treating those around them awful, you know? You know, that really displeases God's heart, amen? And basically what God is saying, and this is, I'll read you the wording on this again. It says, um, liberate yourself from your iniquities by showing mercy and loving kindness to the poor and oppressed, right? And so he, in other words, he's saying, you need to be kind, amen? Like King, you need to be kind. You need to treat people who you deem are less than you or who are in a lower standing than you, quote unquote, with respect. You need to learn how to get your heart right, amen? And there's so many people that because of a place of power, because of a place of corruption, because of a place of a lot of influence or money or whatever in this past season, or because of a place where they have a big title of some sort, you know, they have really been not treating the people well that God has had caused them to, to steward. Amen. You know, they have been treating people ugly and God's going, I'm not putting up with that anymore. This does not demonstrate my heart. Amen. And he's going, this is not going to be tolerated anymore. God is dealing with this right now in this season. And he's going, as a result, you're going to probably have to experience some isolation now, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he brought it on himself. Amen. Because he kept stirring people up. He kept coming after people, attacking them, doing wrong things towards them. Amen. If you guys notice, there has been a big flare up with this spirit of accusation that is moving through people right now. That's part of what we're talking about today is how these voices of accusation are being dealt with. And we can see that in operation through King Nebuchadnezzar and the way that he is treating people. And so God's going, I'm not only looking for your lip service. I need to see some action showing that you are willing to repent for the way that you have been treating friends, family, your subjects, all of these people under you. Amen. And so it says in verse 28, all of this was fulfilled and came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29, this is powerful. This is a repentance season that God gave him that he failed the test on. Verse 29, and at the end of 12 months, he was walking in the royal palace of Babylon. The king said, is not this the great Babylon I have built? Notice the pride in that statement. God gets zero glory. He's all talking about me, me, me. I did this, right? 
Is not this the great Babylon that I had built in the royal residence and seat of government by the might and the power and for the honor and glory of my majesty? Notice how he's exalting himself. There's zero credit going to God in this circumstance. And he's walking around looking at, I'm all that. Look at all of this that I've done. Look at my accomplishments. And this is how a lot of leaders have been in this season. You know, they think that they've been able to do it without God. And they have very much been trying to operate without God. Some of these people, this is really what God has been showing me, you know, spend a lot of their time talking about God. They spend a lot of their time doing godly things, but there is zero relationship there. Amen. You know, these people spend all day there in ministry positions, ladies and gents. I'm not just talking about secular stuff. I'm talking about ministers, you know, and God sees these people's hearts who are basically doing all of their time doing, you know, God activities, but their hearts are far from him. Amen. They're going, look at this empire that I built. I built this church. I built this evangelism outreach. I built this ministry. I did this. And it's all based on their own works. And it's not based on dependence to God. And God's going, that's not going to fly in this season. You know, you keep, that's very pharisaical, right? What did the Pharisees do? They constantly talked about their own good works, their own righteousness. You know, they didn't truly have a dependence on God. Yeah, they talked about him 24 seven, but they didn't rely on the love of God to get them through. What did we just talk about in part one? We talked about how the key to getting out of these chains of bondage that the enemy has try been trying to keep you in in this past season is by quit trying to do everything in your own strength right now. We got to quit it. Amen. We've got to acknowledge our dependence upon God. We've got to acknowledge how much we need him in this season. Humble ourselves. Give him the credit. Say, thank you, God, that you pull me through. This is not all on me to fix everything that's going on in my life. God, I decree that I need you in my personal life. I thank you for your love, for your good nature towards me. And when we do that, that's what breaks us free. But the king, unfortunately, did not learn his lesson. Amen. So at the end of this 12 months time period, basically, God was about to remove this king. Amen. But notice that even while God brought the king down, Daniel was still untouched. Amen. I think that's powerful. Some of you guys need to receive that. You know, a lot of you guys will watch in this season some major storms that go on around you. You will watch people walk through some hard stuff who have not been obedient to the Lord. And for some of these people, their finances are going to be affected. You know, um, they're, you know, going to walk through some isolating stuff. And that's hard, especially when it's people that you love and care about. Amen. None of us enjoy seeing people that we, you know, like walk through hardship. Amen. But sometimes God has to do this because it's for their good in the long run. And if he didn't allow them to walk through this season, they might never repent. And eventually they could end up in hell, ladies and gents. And so it really is God's love and mercy that allows justice to come forth when they choose themselves not to get their heart in a place of repentance. Amen. Um, Verse 31, it says, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. In other words, this voice of the Lord goes out and he goes, no, I'm not allowing you to steward this anymore. You had your chance. You chose not to repent. You're in this place of built up pride. You're choosing to rely on your own strength instead of acknowledging me and relying on my strength. As a result, this is getting stripped from you. Verse 32, and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling will be with the living creatures of the field. You will be made to eat grass like the oxen and seven times or years shall pass over until you have learned and know that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. In other words, this king was kind of being forced into a wilderness season of his personal life. And this is what God is doing with a lot of leaders and a lot of people who have been puffed up in a place of pride in this season and who have been unwilling to repent. He is forcing them, quote unquote, into a wilderness season, a season of reexamination in their personal lives where they're going to not be able to rely on their own strength. Amen. You know, for a lot of leaders... God will allow them to walk through stuff or just people in general who are puffed up in a place of pride, right? He will allow them to walk through stuff to get their attention over and over and over again until they will finally acknowledge, hey, I can't do this in my own strength. Amen. I can't continue to walk this way. You know, I can't continue to think that it can be all on me in my personal life. You know, I've got to have the love of God. I've got to have his grace on my life. I've got to have his strength to get me through these storms that I have been walking through. Amen. And so God will do it. He will get people's attention. Amen. 
And some of these people have failed the test who have been in a place of pride. And so they are being demoted from these positions. Um, and even from, you know, let's, let's talk about this, not even from a leadership capacity. That's a big part of what God is talking about right now, but this could be just prideful people who have, you know, hard hearts in general right now. They are being faced with the decision right now. And there are two groups of people in this group that have been operating in pride. And some of them have been deliberate, kind of like King Nebuchadnezzar. Some of them, it hasn't been as deliberate, but they're noticing that they've been in this place, right? Um, and, you know, I've had areas of my own life where God's sifting me on this right now. And what God is saying is you have a choice to make. You can either receive correction. Amen. You can either receive, you know, what I am trying to get you to walk into and decree your dependence upon me and quit trying to do things in your own strength. Or you can choose the prideful route and to stay in that place. And then if you stay in that place, you're going to get cut down and removed and you're going to have to walk around the mountain a few more times, so to speak, right? Um, so that you are not going to be able to stay in these positions because you're hurting the people under you. You're hurting the people around you. Amen. And so basically, um, God drives him out and he puts him in a place where he is not surrounded by people. Amen. You know, the unfortunate reality is sometimes God has to get you isolated to get your attention. Amen. And this is exactly what was happening to King Nebuchadnezzar. He was puffed up in this place of pride. And so God removes the friendships from his life. He removes the people from around him. Amen. And he gets him in a place where he is basically stripped down to having almost nothing. Picture this. I don't, I don't know if you guys ever caught this from looking at scripture. But this is a, a guy who is used to living in extreme luxury, right? This is a king. He's the guy who had the ultimate power. And all of a sudden, he's not surrounded by people. Amen. He's living off of the land, basically. Let me read you this part of scripture. I thought this was fascinating. Um, it says, well, where was that? Oh, here it is in verse 33. That very hour, the thing was in the process of being fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and he did eat grass like oxen, as Daniel said he would. And his body was wet with the dew of the heavens until his hair grew like the eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. Okay, so you talk about a guy who's probably the most well-groomed person in the kingdom, right? Clothed in royalty, looking super regal. You want to talk about a humbling, right? This guy had claws. His nails looked like bird claws because they were so unkept. He's walking around with literal dew and rain on him from being out in the wilderness, right? And God's going, you think you're all that? You're not all that. Watch me. Watch me, king. You know, I was more than merciful to you. I did everything that I could to try to help you to not have to face this circumstance. But because your heart was in a proud place, now you're going to see who is king. Now we're going to do things my way. I tried to let you get out of this, you know, um, in a way where you were not going to have to go through all of this. But now you're going to have to go through some stuff. Because I care more about your salvation and I care more about you not having to ultimately perish in the end, you know, than you not having to walk through a few storms in this life. Amen. And so basically in verse 34, it says at the end of the days or those seven years, and I think that is so symbolic. A lot of you guys know the number seven in the Bible a lot of times represents perfection right? It represents, you know, a time of completion, right? Remember when God created the earth, you know, he rested on the seventh day and it was completed, right? And so it's very symbolic that that's seven years was how long he had to go through this processing season where God was delivering him from this place of pride and where he was experiencing this demotion, quote unquote, before God could raise him back up. And here's the deal that I want to say. You know, I think that we've got to be very, very careful to not just discount people because of a past season of disobedience. You know, God can deal with people's hearts and he can use them again, amen, in a future season. Uh, you know, God is an expert at restoring what has been lost in people's lives. And so, you know, yeah, the king messed up and yeah, he was really wrong and really prideful, but even people who look like they are the farthest gone, God can still touch their hearts and he can still bring them back into the places of positioning, you know, that he wants them to operate in. Amen. And so it says, 
Um, at the end of the seven days, or of the days, seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding and the right use of my mind returned to me. Amen. Notice what's interesting is, you know, when he was trying to rely on his own strength and when God had him in the wilderness, it says that he didn't have right use of his mind. Ladies and gents, that's what it looks like when we try to rely on our own strength instead of God's strength. And when we try to, you know, operate outside of a place of relationship with God in our personal lives, when we talk all about him without actually relying on him and leaning on him, you know, in a way we're kind of out of our right minds. Amen. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar experienced out in the wilderness. And so then eventually after he had been humbled and put through this process, it was kind of this extreme crushing season in his life, right? What happens is it says the right use of his mind returns to him. And notice the first thing that he did after his quote unquote mind returns to him, after he got rid of this whole prideful, I can do it on my own attitude. It says, I blessed the most high God and I praised and honored and glorified him who lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. That right there is your ticket. Ladies and gents, we've been talking about how to break free from this bondage, these, you know, chains. Nebuchadnezzar finally was starting to get it in this situation. He blessed the Most High God. He praised, he honored his name. He acknowledged that God was the one who was in control. He gave him the glory that he deserved. Amen. And as he did that, notice it says that his mind was back in right standing. Again, this is when we know that we're back in a rightful place with God and that God has sifted this pride out of our, you know, life. It's when we quit giving ourselves all the credit, you know, and when we start to glorify God and thank him for all of the things that he's done in our personal lives, when we quit trying to just rely on our own strength and, you know, get rid of this anxiety and this being worked up all the time, right? And when we fully surrender to his love and say, God, thank you for who you are. Amen. Thank you for your goodness in my life. There's powerful things that come from that place of praise. Amen. And so notice that he was still praising God in the midst of that field, in the midst of that place where he was in the wilderness, right? And the moment that he began to praise was when his deliverance began to come. Amen. Um, listen to verse 35. It says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say at his hand or say to him, What are you doing? Verse 36, now at the same time, my reason and understanding returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My majesty and splendor returned to me and my counselors and my Lord sought me out. Listen to me, when it's your time to pop back up on the scene, when you truly repent, God will find others to seek you out. God will find others to help to step you into the places of positioning that he has for you in your personal life. You're not gonna have to go seek out all of this stuff. Amen. When you are simply obedient to what God has called you to do, he will give you favor with the right people, favor with the right men, favor with the right relationships in your personal life. And once the king had gotten this icky, prideful junk out of his life, God caused the right people to seek him out. And I want you guys to know that God is the author of redemption stories. If there is anyone who is unworthy, quote unquote, to maintain the position of king again. It was probably this guy. He was a pretty prideful, puffed up person that we just read in scripture. And a lot of you guys, you know, all of us included, have walked through seasons of our life where we probably didn't deserve to have God redeem us. We didn't deserve to have these good gifts, these blessings that the Lord is wanting to bring into our lives. You know, that how many of you guys know that God is so good that if you will just return to him, return to him with your whole heart, you know, from this season of being wayward, wayward and trying to do stuff in your own strength, amen, if you will just return God in his love, not based on how good you are, but based on how good he is, can return to you a season of your life where you can steward the promotion well and where you can receive his very best and receive redemption over your life. I don't care how dark your story has been in your past. You know, some of the people I have met with some of the darkest times that they have walked through in their past have some of the most powerful redemption testimonies in their personal life. Don't you dare count yourself out because you've had a season of failure in your past. And then God wants to, you know, raise you up and use you again, but you gotta repent. You gotta get your heart right, amen? You've got to decree and start to depend on your reliance being upon him, right? Um, 
And so, in other words, King Nebuchadnezzar was reestablished in his kingdom. And listen to this verse. It says, and still more greatness than before was added to me. Notice that when you humble yourself before God and when you decree your dependence is upon him and not on your own strength, even more greatness can be added to you in your personal life. And this is what God is saying right now is it is critical to walk into a place of humility with him right now. And as you do that, more greatness is going to be added upon you. You know, as you overcome these trials and these storms and these places of bondage that had held you back in these previous seasons. <coughs> Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, whose works are all faithful and right and whose ways are just. And listen to what he says here. This is powerful. And those who walk in pride, he is able to abase and humble. Amen. This is what God is doing right now. You know, um, not only with authority, but just people in general who have been very prideful, you know, and thinking that they can do it on their own and not walking in their own strength. God is going, no, I'm able to humble these people. You know, they chose not to repent in this time frame. They chose not to turn back to me. And guess what? You know, some of these people are going to be going through it a little bit, ladies and gents. So, okay. All of that to say, there is another part to this that I really want to dive into with this second part. And I want to read you some scripture regarding this and how Daniel was used again and how these voices of accusation came up again in this particular circumstance. So basically, the king Nebuchadnezzar passes away. We're hopping into king number two here. Daniel is still alive. There's this transition in leadership that happens. And there is this guy called Bel Belshazzar that is raised up that was a descendant of King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And so basically what happens is there is this grand feast that is happening under this new king's rule, right? And something really, really um, weird happens in the midst of this feast. Listen to this. In verse five, it says, immediately and suddenly there appeared the fingers of a man's hand and wrote on the plaster of the wall opposite the candlestick, so exposed especially to the light in the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Kind of creepy, right? <laughs> Let's keep going. Verse six, then the color and the drunken hilarious brightness of the king's face was changed and his terrifying thoughts troubled and alarmed him and the joints and muscles of his hips and back gave way and his knees smote together. The king cried aloud mightily to bring the enchanters or soothsayers, the diviners and the astrologers, the king said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever will read this writing and show me the interpretation of it will be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold put about their neck and will be the third ruler in the kingdom. All the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation of it. And so basically this really spooky almost incident happens, you know, definitely supernatural, right? And, you know, the king is obviously in a place of compromise because who's the first person that he turns to? The world, amen? This is so symbolic of people who, you know, are claiming Christ but are still turning to the world solely, you know, for a place of answers and solutions, amen? It doesn't work. It represents a place of compromise and pride, amen? And so this new king is still operating in a place that he shouldn't be, right? And so guess who gets raised up again to help to provide the solution? Our Daniel, right? And so basically what happens is he's brought in before the new king and he basically says in verse 13, are you that Daniel of the children of the captivity of Judah who the king my father brought out of Judah? He says, I have heard of you and that the spirit of the holy God or gods is in you and that the light and understanding of superior wisdom are found in you. And so basically he says, if you can provide me the interpretation behind what this weird incident is supposed to be, you know, I'm going to honor you and lift you up. Right. And so, um, where do I want to start here with the rest of this? Uh, it talks a little bit about, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar and the way that he's operated in the past. Here's the interpretation that Daniel gave in verse 24. Then was the part of the hand sent from the presence of the Most High God, and the writing was inscribed. And this is the inscription that was written. Mean, uh, mine, mine, tekel, erpsharen, numbered, numbered, weighed divisions. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mine, God has numbered the days of your kingship, and he has brought them to an end. Wow, this is powerful. Tekel, you are weighed in the balances, and you are found wanting. Do you guys remember that word that I gave you guys 
several months ago now, I don't remember exactly how long, where I was talking to you guys about how I had that vision of that scale and it was tipped where one side was a lot higher than the other and that represented injustice and how things have not been, you know, um, just for a long season. And then I talked about how God was weighing the scale where it was being evened out on both sides. Immediately as I read this, God reminded me of that. And basically, this is what's happening to prideful leaders right now. They are being weighed. The tips of the scales of injustice that have been out of balance are being brought back into a place of justice again as God is dealing with these leaders that have been really causing people to suffer that have been underneath them, right? So to Kel, you are weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. Perez, your kingdom and your kingship are divided and are given to the Medes and the Persians. And so in other words, you know, everything that he had rule and authority over is being stripped away and is being given away. Amen. And that's where God is raising up new godly leadership, people who are going to steward things well and people who are not going to walk in the place of pride. Amen. Then Belshazzar commented and Daniel was clothed with purple and a chain of gold was put about his neck. And a proclamation was made concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. During that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom. He was about 62 years old. So now we're on king number three. And guess who stood through all of it? Daniel. You know, through the midst of trials and opposition and lots of changes, right? Daniel still was persevering through all of this because he stayed close to God. Amen. So here we've got king number three. Let's talk about this because this is where the lion's den comes in. Um, and then as soon as we get through this part, I'll kind of leave it alone because I know I've been on for a long time and my voice is starting to go out a little bit. Um, but this is very important. So in chapter six, verse one, it says, it pleased King Darius, successor to Belshazzar, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps should be in charge all throughout the kingdom and over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might give account to them and that the king should have no loss or damage. In other words, he was raising up these godly people of wisdom to kind of protect the king from experiencing loss in different areas. Really, he was kind of smart for setting up this system, right? Because um, it's accountability, it's people to help him out, right? Um, then in verse three, it says, then this Daniel was distinguished above the presidents and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Notice that the favor of God is just crazy on Daniel, not because of him operating in his own strength, but because of how close he chose to stay to God and not walk in his own wisdom, but to walk in the wisdom of the Lord. You want your ticket to success, ladies and gents? Daniel got it. We could, If we would mold our lives after Daniel, amen, and this wisdom that he was walking in, we would see powerful things happen, amen? And if we would understand that the key to our success is not just our own works and operating in our own strength and accomplishments, the key to your success is staying close to God, ladies and gents. All right, verse four, then the presidents and the satraps sought to find occasion to bring accusation against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no accusation or fault for he was faithful, nor is there any error or fault found in him. This is what happens when you truly follow and serve God in your personal lives a lot of the time, ladies and gents. It's unfair, but because there is favor on your life, it will attract accusation. It will attract opposition from the enemy camp. And as an unfair as it is, there will be people that are in a place puffed up with pride who were sent by the enemy to try to take you out, to try to fault find. There has been a ton of this going on in this past season, fault finding and accusation and unfair stuff that isn't even true. Gossip, slander, these voices of the enemy have been coming against people like nobody's business in this past season. And what's interesting is it's undeserved, right? Like Daniel in this circumstance, it says they could find no occasion or fault for he was faithful because there wasn't any error found in him, amen? And so then what these demonic voices had to start doing was creating errors that they could throw at him because they couldn't find any, you know, that he was just outright doing himself. And so they're like, well, we've got to find a way to take this guy down, you know, because remember your war is not flesh and blood. Amen. These are demons operating through people trying to take you out and take you down. Amen. You know, these people that have been puffed up in a place of pride. Amen. And so basically, you know, it's, it's a battle of light versus darkness. And because you represent light, 
there's a lot of warfare and opposition through this accusation, this gossip, this slander, this stuff that the enemy has been using, you know, because the enemy doesn't want the faithful ones in power and in control and in charge, you know, because if they are, he knows that that's the end of it, you know, for the enemy camp, right? And so there's this all out war that is being launched against Daniel when he has done nothing wrong simply because he stands for the light. Amen. And a lot of you guys don't understand that the reason you've had so much warfare coming against your life is not because you've done anything wrong, but it's because of who you stand for. It's because of what you stand for. And yeah, it's unfair sometimes. Amen. But it's part of it, unfortunately, being a child of God. Amen. And how many of you guys know that ultimately God is the one who has the final say? And even though you have to walk through this unfairness, sometimes God can still deliver you from it. And that's what he is doing right now in this season is he is weighing those scales. Amen. And he is delivering us from these voices of accusation right now in this season. Okay. And so basically... All of these evil people, these voices, and notice it's the majority. It is the crowd that is coming against Daniel. You know, some of you guys are so powerful by yourself, amen, that they had to team up on you, amen, because what you carry, you can stand on your own, not because of how great you are, but because of Jesus on the inside of you, that a whole gang of these demonic forces have had to come up against you just to stand against one person, amen. That's how powerful God on the inside of you is, ladies and gents. And so in verse seven, it says, all the presidents of the kingdom, the deputies and the satraps, the counselors, the governors have consulted and agreed that the king should establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, except for you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So they're out to murder this guy. They didn't just kind of, sort of not like Daniel. These are demons, right? Operating through people that were seeking to take out his life, amen, because he posed a threat to them. You know, they were thinking, think about this from a person's perspective. This is what's been going on to a lot of you guys right now. You know, there are a lot of people around you who have been looking at your life and who have been viewing your promotion as a threat to them directly, amen? They don't think that there's enough room for everyone at the table, amen, because they're not close to the heart of God, amen? They have been operating in bitterness and in jealousy because of the favor on your life, kind of like Daniel, right? And as a result, they have very much gotten in their own feelings, right? They have not been obedient to God. They have not been praying for their enemies. You know, they have gotten in this very, you know, warped state state of mind and therefore are letting the enemy use them, even if they're not inherently a bad person. How many of you guys know the enemy can still work through people, right? And so as a result, they purposely launched this multifaceted attack against Daniel to try to bring him down because they perceive him to be a threat. Amen. Some of you guys, the reason you have gone through so much is they perceive you to be a threat because of who God is on the inside of you, because of what you carry. Amen. And so basically they said, you know what? The one area where we can poke at this guy, quote unquote, is we can poke at the fact that he's never going to, you know, not submit to God. Amen. And so <laughs> it's going to end up biting them that they tried to launch this attack. But nevertheless, they really tried to make Daniel go through it. And that's where a lot of you guys have been. So um, basically they went to the authority. Unfortunately, King Darius did end up writing and signing that decree. And look at what Daniel's response was. I just love Daniel. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. He had his windows being open in the chamber toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and three times a day prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. He didn't try to hide his walk with God. He didn't try to cower at the fact that he was facing opposition and these people were launching these accusations against him. He didn't try to change what he was doing. He just kept living his life for the Lord. Amen. And how many of you guys know that sometimes you just simply living your life for the Lord stirs up people against you. It gets them angry as all get out. It's like, you know, stirring up a hornet's nest. We had that word about the hornet's nest a while back, right? And these people are furious that ground is being taken for the kingdom. And so they're buzzing and they're swarming around and all of this stuff. And the enemy is getting terrified because he knows he's losing territory. Amen. That has been what is going on right now, right? And so basically, 
It says in verse 11, then these men came thronging by agreement and found Daniel praying and making supplication. And so then they're going to go and tattletale. Amen. There's a lot of people in your life who have been trying to tattletale on you, you know, going to people in leadership, trying to, you know, nitpick every little thing they can about you to try to throw you under the bus. There's been friendships in your life. There's been family members in your life. There's been authority figures in your life who is just like, they are looking to fault find. They are looking to come after you in any way, shape, or form. Understand that there are demons operating through these people, ladies and gents. It's not just that person that's doing this stuff. There is an all-out spiritual war that has been launched against your life, ladies and gents, because you operate for God. Amen? And so this is what's going on is the enemy is trying his hardest to take you out. But how many of you guys know that God has the final say? Amen. These voices of accusation may have a temporary, you know, situation where it looks like they've got the upper hand against you. But if you stay close to God and stay obedient, you will have the victory because the fight is a fixed fight. It's already won. Amen. And so in verse 16, it says, The king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you are serving, continually deliver you. I want to hop back to verse 14 because, you know, Daniel, even though he was in the midst of a very hard circumstance, you know, still had a lot of favor with leadership. You know, um, Back in the day, once a king issued a decree, it could not be changed. That word was law, literally, right? So it didn't matter how King Darius felt about this situation. There was no one doing this, amen? And what's interesting is King Darius actually liked Daniel. He was rooting for him to come through in a place of victory in this circumstance, right? And so... Um, basically what happened in verse 14, it says, then the king, when he heard these words was much distressed over what he had done. And he set his mind on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until the sun went down to rescue him. But then ultimately, I'm not going to read all of this for time's sake. He, you know, had to stand by his word and he did have to be cast into the lion's den. So notice that even again, Daniel is still walking in enormous favor because of how close he stayed to God, right? So some of you guys are walking in extra storms on your life because of your obedience to God. Daniel, because he was willing to take a stand, was facing unfair accusations and storms that the other people around him were not having to walk through because he was trying to be obedient to God. Amen. This is where a lot of you guys have been. And yeah, it's unfair. But I want you guys to notice the promotion that he also received on the other side of this. This is why you can't give up right now, ladies and gents. When all these demons are acting up and moving through people and accusing and doing all of this stuff, you can't give up because it's the hardest part of this right now, ladies and gents. And if you can get through this, there's enormous reward on the other side. And God can use you to bring a whole herd of people into the kingdom, amen, through your life being a witness and a testimony, all right? It says, then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the land of lions. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you are serving continually deliver you. Verse 17, and a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that there might be no change of purpose concerning Daniel. So in other words, what was already a hard situation was made to look impossible. Again, God is going to get the glory through Daniel's deliverance in this circumstance. Some of you guys are facing impossible circumstances right now in your personal life where you're going, there's no way that God could deliver me from this multifaceted attack that has been launched against me. It looks like your fate has literally been sealed. So symbolic of that stone being put over this pit, right? But I want to tell you guys that God moves in the supernatural and he has the final say. You can't look at this through simply natural eyes. This is where you have to rely on the goodness of his nature. I'm, I'm emphasizing this a thousand ten percent right now because this is the key to getting those bondages, those places where you have been bound off of your life, is so relying on God's love for you, his heart, his goodness for you in this season. And that's what causes miracles to break forth and your deliverance to come forth. Amen. And so 
It says, then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music or dancing girls brought before him and his sleep fled from him. Verse 19, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den and to Daniel, he cried out in a voice of anguish. The king said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you continually serve able to deliver you from the lions? Verse 21, then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent and blameless before him and also before you, O king, as you very well know. I have done no harm or wrong. So this is what God was showing me in my God time the last few days with him. These lion's mouths are very symbolic of the voices of accusation that have been coming against you in your personal life. Amen. You know, um, the lion's mouth represents slander and accusation that is currently being dealt with. Amen. Um, and so it's very symbolic that he was thrown into a lion's den because the attack that caused him to be launched into that den was voices of accusation. And this is what so many of you guys have been dealing with, accusation from friends, from family, from you know people in the workplace, from authority figures, ministers, whatever this looks like, right? Unfair accusation has been a very strong attack that has been going on for not just a little bit now. It's been a long time for some of you guys that you've been dealing with this stuff, right? And so if you read in verse 23, so we're again in Daniel chapter 6, verse 23, it says, Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel should be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no hurt of any kind was found on him, because this is why. This is the key. I'm going to keep emphasizing this right now, ladies and gents. Because he believed in, relied on, adhered to, and trusted in his God. That's our job right now, ladies and gents period. Trust in the goodness of God's character. Trust in the goodness of his nature. Amen. Believe in what he says about the good plans that he has for your life. Amen. Walk by faith and not by sight. This is the ticket out of this bondage that so many of you have been walking through. All right. Verse 24. I love this. It says, and the king commanded and those men who had accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, their wives, and before they had ever reached the bottom of the den, the lions had overpowered them and had broken their bones into pieces. I want you guys to notice this. They themselves reaped what they had tried to take Daniel out with. This very much reminds me of Haman, um, kind of in the book of Esther, you know, where you reap what you sow. What you tried to launch against somebody else, you end up reaping in return. You know, um, this is why sometimes God asks us to walk through a storm instead of just delivering us from the storm. He'll do both in our lives. There are some storms in your life that God will just deliver you from. He'll say, you don't have to walk through this thing, you know, but there are other storms that God will ask you to walk through because it's going to be a witness and a testimony to those around you. Amen. So the storm that couldn't take Daniel out ended up taking out these voices of accusation, ended up taking out the very people who tried to launch this thing against him in the first place. It showed who God was truly standing behind. Some of you guys, the reason that God has asked you to walk through these storms in your life is because at the end, everybody's going to see who was truly with you. Amen. You know, a lot of these people who have been watching your life kind of from an outside perspective have been going, man, all the stuff that this person has had to walk through in their life in this past season, I think it would have killed me. Everything that they've had to walk through, all of the resistance that they've faced, all of the unfairness of all of this stuff. And you know what? It would have for a lot of them. God is the one who gave you the supernatural strength to walk through these storms. God is the one who gave you the ability to fight through these voices of accusation and to keep your faith and your hope in him. Amen. And he uses you to be a witness and a testimony. And in the end, guess what? The enemies got dealt with. Amen. You know, these people ended up, you know, instantly, you know, before they even reached the bottom of the pit, it says that they were devoured. Amen. You know, keep in mind that these voices of accusation are being dealt with 
right now in this season. And a lot of you guys have felt like you were in the pit with those lions. You know, there's been a lot of fear that's been trying to swirl around you. A lot of what ifs that the enemy has been trying to throw at you in your circumstances. It's felt very hopeless. You don't see the way out of this circumstance, but you don't realize that the angel of the Lord has been there guarding you. God has dispatched heavenly help to be with you in the midst of the lion's den. And it's going to be a witness and a testimony to everybody around you who, who tried to put you in that fiery furnace, quote unquote, who tried to put you in that lion's den to show them you picked the wrong person to mess with. Amen. Because I stand with this person. Amen. Because they are my child. And I take personal responsibility for those who try to come after and attack my kids. Amen. Especially when you've done nothing wrong and you're just trying to be obedient. Amen. What I love about this, it says um, in verse 26, again, here's the promotion coming up again. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring and steadfast forever, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even to the end of the world. Again, it's bringing a whole kingdom back to God. God has used Daniel more than once for this. How powerful is this guy's life simply because he has submitted to the Lord? Verse 27. He is a savior and deliverer, and he works signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this man, Daniel, prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Amen. So Daniel, under multiple different leaders, even leaders that were not following the Lord, leaders who were not being you know, obedient to authority, was very prosperous, endured these, you know, was able to walk in these big titles, these big positions, was able to steward these things with wisdom and power simply because his trust was in the Lord and he wasn't willing to compromise. Amen. And God protected him through every ounce of accusation and attack that he was facing in his personal life. Ladies and gents, I want to tell you guys, it's not over. That's what God wanted me to hop on and tell you guys today. He is dealing with these voices of accusation. He is dealing with the prideful leaders and things that have been hindering you from stepping into your destiny. He is removing those whose hearts are unrepentant and who were not willing to get obedient. And for some of you guys, he's also examining you yourself personally in this. You know, I think that this is not just something where we just go, oh, God's just only dealing with other people. He's been dealing with me too on this stuff, ladies and gents. I don't care how close you are to God, we all can use some self-examination in these different areas of our life, you know? But I just want to encourage you guys today. Daniel's strength did not come from his own works. It didn't come from him having all the answers, knowing all the answers. It came from him just trusting how much God loved him and saying, God, I want to rely on you in this season. I choose to honor you. I choose to be obedient. I'm not going to keep living in a lifestyle of sin. I'm not going to keep trying to do things my own way and in my own strength. I'm going to just choose to rely on your love for me and to walk in relationship with you. And ladies and gents, there's something so powerful on your life. You know, it's interesting, and I want to reiterate this. Daniel walked in both favor and a lot of warfare at the exact same time in his life throughout his life. Amen. A lot of people feel like they have done something wrong because they're under a lot of warfare in their life. Not necessarily, ladies and gents. Sometimes the reason that you're experiencing more warfare than the people around you is because you're doing something right, is because you're so favored, is because God is on your life. Amen. But understand that God has the final say and that even what the enemy tries to launch against you, to try to take you out. God can use it for your good. And ultimately he can make it the biggest testimony in your personal life that people will remember for years to come. What do we remember Daniel for? The lion's den, the biggest problem that he ever faced in his life. That problem that some of you guys have been facing, whether it's reoccurring illness, whether it's relationship problems, whether it's you know hiccups in your ministry, in your workplace, at your job, with your kids, with your family, whatever it is, that thing that the enemy meant to take you out, God's gonna use it to be the very thing that people remember you by. Amen. You know, God is the one that has the solutions in your personal life. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you guys today, don't fear the problems. You know, I'm not saying that they're not fun. 
you know, <laughs> they're, they're awful to walk through. I don't think any of us would pick to go in a lion's den. I don't think any of us would go, yeah, sign me up for the fiery furnace, right? Like that's not something that we would do, right? But God can use it for his glory. And I want you guys to remember that he's got the final say. Those enemies that you're facing in your life, those voices of accusation, they are not bigger than God. The enemy will try to convince you that they are. It may look like it in the natural. Everything in the natural may be screaming at you that they are bigger than God. They're not bigger than God, ladies and gents. And I just want you guys to embrace his love right now and to rest. Rest in his goodness. Rest in the fact that you don't know how he's going to pull you through, but he's going to pull you through. Ladies and gents, he's the one who's fighting for you. And you can either try to fight this stuff in your own strength, which is not going to get you very far, or you can rely on his strength. Let him go before you. Let him fight for you on this stuff. Recognize that the battle belongs to the Lord. And when you do that, you're going to see him come through for you in a mighty way in this season. So don't be discouraged by these voices of accusation. Ladies and gents, it's a temporary attack. I know it's been going on for a while for a lot of people, but guess what? These voices of accusation don't have the final say. And if they choose not to repent, guess what? They're going to be dealt with. You know, the very pit that they tried to put you in with the lions, quote unquote, with their mouths that have been barking in this season, you know, is going to ultimately be the thing that unfortunately takes them out if they don't choose to get out of this prideful place. Amen. So I will leave it there for today. Hope you guys have a great day. I'll chat with you again soon.